All right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our Wednesday morning Life Light Bible study on the life of David. And uh, we're a little, we're a little light in attendance due to the holiday. People are in various places and they're not feeling well. But Christ is here with us. And so we are going to study uh, his word and allow him to work in our hearts and our minds. And I pray that that happens uh, with you that are here with us, either in the, in the fellowship hall or Zooming at home for those that will watch later. May you be blessed and drawn closer to your Lord and Savior. We begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And we're going to start with our opening song, which is number 802 in our hymnals, uh, Immortal, Invincible, God Only Wise. <clears throat> and I'll get that on the screen. God willing, only care. I know the first verse. <laughs> that always helps, brother. First three or four words, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I want to try to draw it up in my memory here. <clears throat> Continue on with our uh, responsive reading with our intro, it, and uh, you'll have to give me a moment. And I don't have that quite ready. I will put it on the screen in just a moment, God willing. It's a way to start our day. <laughs> Wonderful song. It is, isn't it? Beautiful. I did remember most of it. Good. All right, we'll be ready here in just a moment. Sorry about that. Uh, 
We continue on with our responsive reading. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Give ear to my pleas for mercy. And your faithfulness answer me and your righteousness. Enter not into judgment with your servant. For no one living is righteous before you. I remember the days of old. I meditate on all that you have done. I ponder the works of your hands. I stretch out my hands to you. My, my soul thirsts for you like heart. heart Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. Let and your good spirit and, and lead me. Crown. For your name's sake, O oh Lord, preserve my life. In and your in righteousness, righteousness, bring, me bring my soul of trouble. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Give ear to my pleas for mercy. In your faithfulness, answer me in righteousness. Let us pray. Gracious God, Heavenly Father, we gather before you as your precious children who at times err. At times, Lord, we are unthankful. Uh, we lose track of all of the blessings that you give us. The most important being the continued forgiveness of sins that we have by faith in you. Stir us up, Lord, to a greater love for you, to a greater understanding of what your sacrifice on the cross, how, how great it is and what it means to each one of us. And along with that, Lord, all the gifts that you give us that we enjoy and we forget about or take for granted. <clears throat> given us your word, and we thank you for that and ask that you would be present as we study it. And Heavenly Father, we thank you that we are called your precious children and can lift to you these cares and concerns, which we do now. Be with our brother Ron, Lord. Grant him continued healing from double pneumonia. Restore him completely to health. Lord, in your mercy, be with JR, Lord. May you grant him the health and healing that he needs. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord God, be with uh, Al, who is traveling to see family over the Thanksgiving break. And be with all of those who will be traveling today, tomorrow, and this weekend. Grant them all safe travels to their destination and bring them safely back home to us. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Be with Jack, Lord. We ask that the treatments that are going to start, they would start soon and they would be effective for his recovery and continue to be with Jill and grant her comfort and strength that comes from her faith in you. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord God, be with Ruth, our sister Ruth. Grant her strength and healing through the chemo treatments that she is getting. Uh, lift her up physically, emotionally, and spiritually as she goes through this. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord God, I appeal to you on behalf of myself that you would Grant me healing head to toe and body and soul. Lift me up and make me uh, able for the task of leading worship tonight and bringing your message to everyone. And may it speak in my heart first and then through me, uh, through your spirit speaking to everyone else. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord God, we ask that you would be with the Luke Clinic and especially uh, Susan as she heads down uh, this afternoon to serve dinner and does a devotion for them. May the medical service that they provide and the food that they provide and the fellowship and God's word that they provide, may that all be Jesus' arms and legs to them. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, be with Dallas and his family this Thanksgiving time as they remember and miss loved ones who have passed on. Grant them the hope and the strength that comes from knowing you and your son as our Lord and Savior. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord, be with all those others. <laughs> are in need of prayer that we may not even realize or we have forgotten. You know what they need, Lord, and you know how to address it best, and we would trust them over into your care. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. And Lord God, we ask that you would be with our worship tonight, uh, that all would hear your word preached and would take it to heart, and that all who are involved in that service would be lifted up and be enabled to make it a worshipful time towards you, knowing that you are a gracious and loving God who is not a stickler. When, when we make mistakes and mess up, Lord, you forgive. May that word of forgiveness be preached clearly tonight. And also, Lord, we ask that you would grant us good fellowship and the high social following. 
Lord, in your mercy. Hear our Lord. prayer. All of these things we commend over into your care, gracious Father, trusting in your love for each one of us. And all God's people respond. Amen. We pray the collect of the day. Almighty and ever-loving God, you have given exceedingly great and precious promises to those who trust in you. Dispel from us the works of darkness and grant us to live in the light of your Son, Jesus Christ, that our faith may never be found wanting. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. Very good. Well, looking back, we left off, we only had a little bit more to go in chapter 20. And it's really just a little bit more. We could have actually probably hung out and blown through it and, and gone right to the study guide. But we will get to day three. We're going to do day the questions under day three in session seven. But uh, just a few more verses to read to end off chapter 20. And uh, there's some little bit of things there to talk about, even though it's not many. Oh, excuse me. So I apologize for that. Let's... Uh, Put those verses on the screen. And what do we, we need to read? Uh, oh, we should probably do a little bit of a recap, bring everybody up to date, and then we'll do those verses. So there, uh, David has come back from uh, uh, across the Jordan where he went uh, during Absalom's rebellion, and he's trying to bring the nation back together. And there was a troublemaker named Sheba, and Sheba collected with himself some of those who had uh, still aligned themselves with Absalom and says, we have no share with David, no part of his son, every man to his tent. And he takes off. Um, and David knows that this has to be addressed. And so he gathers his new general, which is Amasa, who was the general for uh, Absalom. And David promotes him in place of Joab. We said, well, probably for a couple of reasons, because uh, Joab killed his son disobeyed his order. And also Joab might have been um, on his bad side because he went to David and said, hey, quit your whining and crying. Get out there and, 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 and welcome your troops like the conquering heroes that they are. But after all that, uh, David uh, promotes Amasa, who was uh, Absalom's general, and makes him a general of the army. And he gives him his first assignment when he gets back to Jerusalem, and that is we need to take care of this guy Sheba. Go gather up uh, 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 enough troops to go do that. So Amasa goes out, but he takes longer than the time the king had set for him. The king said, go in three days. <clears throat> Possibly that's because uh, many of the troops are still loyal to Joab. And they also know that Amasa was a traitor and they don't want anything to do with him. When David sees that Amasa is not having success, he calls on Abishai. Remember, you remember who Abishai is? Related to Job. Brother. Yep, Joab's brother. And uh, Abishai is able to gather some troops. And he they meet uh, out at the Great Rock in Gibeon, which is where Amasa finally comes. Still thinking that he's going to lead the troops into battle because David has promoted him. But lo and behold, who's there? Joab. Joab is there ready to fight. Walks up to Amasa acting in what kind of way? It was friendly. friendly. Yep. I'm going to grab his beard. And, yeah. and evidently in that, in that culture, that was grab the beard and give them a kiss. That was like a handshake. That was a, a, a welcome. Other, but otherwise, the sword that was in his belt seemed to have fallen to the ground. Joab picks it up with his left hand, which would not have bothered Amasa because Joab was right-handed. Most Israelites were right-handed. You would attack with the right hand. So sword in your left hand, he's just picking that up to put it back in his thing. But Joab is not. As he draws Amasa close, um, sticks the sword in, only needs one, one thrust. And Amasa's dead and lying there in a pool of his own blood and guts. And then everybody uh, centers around Joab. And where does Joab lead him to? After Sheba, the traitor. And Sheba by this time has gone through a good portion of Israel all the way to the north. 
and uh, has got himself in a walled city. And Joab comes, and what is Joab's first uh, um, action? What, is, what does he do when he reaches the walled city? Well, they wanted to break down the door. Yeah, he's going to attack it at the top of the walls. Keep in mind, this is not a uh, Philistine city or an Amorite city. This is the city of Israel. And so really, it's a continuation of the Civil War. He's attacking his own, uh, but he stopped. And remember, who, he, who stops Joab from attacking the city? He's a wise woman. A wise woman. And she says some interesting things. She talks about um, this town being the place where people come to find wisdom. And uh, she assures him that they are a peaceful people. And uh, she offers to do what? Oh, well, we'll talk to her people and, and deliver. That's what Sheba's she head. Yeah. Yep. So they're, they're not behind Sheba at all, are they? In oh. fact, as he has maybe a small following, but the city's not behind him. The city would rather survive. And in fact, she... Um, she lays claim or gives testimony to the fact that she's loyal to Israel and loyal to David. And so his head comes over the wall. And what is, how does Joab react to that? Can you go back home? On yeah. He calls off. Everything's done. He calls off the war. He goes back home. And what few followers there were for Sheba, uh, they take off. And so for now, it appears that the, uh, the problem is over with. The revolt is done. That takes us up to just these few other verses uh, left in uh, 2 Samuel 20. And uh, I can put those on the screen. <laughs> uh, verses 23 to the end. Somebody would care to do that. Second Samuel 20, verses 23 to the end. Is it 19 or? Mm, um, no, it should be 2 Samuel 20. We're down in first. Oh, I see where I am. It didn't transfer to Samuel. Or that's so how it didn't transfer. Now Joab was in command of all the army of Israel, and Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, was in command of the Cherethites and the Pelethites, and Adoram was in charge of the forced labor, and Jehoshaphat, the son of Ahilud, was the recorder, and Sheba was secretary, and Zadok and Abathar were priests. And Ira the gyrite was also David's priest. Okay. Who's in command of the army again? Joab. Joab. How does Joab respond to the murder of Amasa? How does Joab respond? Um, how does David, I'm sorry, how does David respond? I don't know. Doesn't look like he's punishing him, is it? No. He's put him back in charge. Why do you think he might have to be, why do you think he might be forced to reinstate Joab as the general? Keep the people behind him. They're used to Joab being. Has, is the, does the army seem to be behind him? Yeah. Joab? Yeah, definitely. Yes. They, they all followed him to the city. And once again, does Joab end the problem? Does he end the civil war? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when it says, you know, Joab returned to Jerusalem to the king and was in command of all the army of Israel. So that means David put him back in command or did he just take it? <laughs> I think maybe a little bit of both. David certainly could have demoted him again and raised up somebody else, but uh, I think David just kind of goes along with it. 
seeks for national security and various other reasons, Joab is best to be there. And Joab has never been a rebel rebelled against David. He's always supported David's David's reign and rule. David just doesn't like the way that he goes about things at times, and who would? But it's kind of maybe a, a necessary evil. Do you think David will ever punish Joy? No. Nope. He, he doesn't do it personally. Yes, that's correct. Keep your finger here in 2 Samuel. Let's turn ahead to a, a book to 1 Kings. 1 Kings chapter 2. We're going to read verses 5 and 6. And this is David giving charge to Solomon. David is about to die. Solomon has been named the new king, and David is giving him final instructions. So second, first Kings chapter two, verses five and six. Moreover, you also know what Joab, the son of Zeruah, did to me, how he dealt with the two commanders of the armies of Israel, Abner, the son of Ner, and Amasa, the son of Jether, whom he killed, avenging in time of peace for blood that had been shed in war, and putting the blood of war on the belt around his waist and on the sandals on his feet. Act, therefore, according to your wisdom, but do not let his gray head go down to Sheol in peace. Let's get right there. So, how does David deal with Joab? Could have him Solomon take. Yep, help Solomon. You yeah. take care of this loose end for me. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we don't know how old Joab is, but he's probably getting older. And Solomon would be able to, uh, being a new king, would be able to promote a new general within the army. The army would accept that. But uh, David doesn't tell him to go out and kill him, does he? Mm -hmm. Just whatever you do, make sure his end is not peaceful. Interesting, isn't it? David has uh, been a courageous man, but for whatever reason, he doesn't seem to have the stomach to deal with Joab himself. He didn't David, deal with a lot of things, so yeah. even, yeah. even with his own kids. Yeah. We, we truly see him as a human being, don't we? Yeah. A lot like us in a lot of ways. Going back to 2 Samuel 20, those final verses, one other thing to point out. Uh, earlier in uh, 2 Samuel, when David first is anointed king over all of Israel, uh, there's a list similar to this of who's in charge of everybody. And it's interesting to note, in that list, some of David's sons are listed as priests, which should be translated not as priests in the temple, but more like palace administrators. They, his sons had a position in the palace running the day-to-day -day activities. Do you see them listed here? They're not. None of these people are David's sons. Why do you think this change has been made? What kind of job has David's sons done as far as uh, in the kingdom and for the kingdom rule? Well, we have, uh, we have uh, uh, the first one, uh, not Amasa, but uh, Amnon raped his, uh, his uh, stepsister. And we have Absalom committed murder and insurrection. So his sons don't have a real good track record for being good administrators or workers in the kingdom or anything like that, do they? So maybe out of David's wisdom, but also maybe, maybe some of the other people are surrounding him saying, you know what? Don't put your kids in charge. <laughs> maybe the, maybe I was going to say, maybe these people were the ones that really supported David through all the 
things that went on. Yeah, yeah, quite, quite, quite true. Very good. Let's turn to our uh, session number seven study guide. And we're at day three. And it asks us to read 2 Samuel 19 to 20, and that's what we've been doing. So let's kind of uh, review what we've read in there and fill with these questions. Uh, it says Absalom's rebellion crushed. David now faced a greater challenge in his attempt to reunite Israel and Judah. He uses his awesome God-given gifts of diplomacy, even in dealing with enemies and opportunists. So 2 Samuel 19, 1 to 39, uh, we're asked to describe how David deals with these people. Uh, and if we don't remember, we can look back at these, but Shemai, Shimei, remember who he was. Is that the one that was cursing him and stuff before and then yes. uh, turned and supported him? Yep. Yep. He was the one that was throwing rocks and stuff as David marched out of town. And what was his attitude when David marched back into town? He was all for David. Yep. He, he uh, but he, did, did he just say, hey, you know what, forget about that. How does he present himself to David? It says, uh, Shimei, son of Gera, the Benjamite, hurried down with the men of Judah to meet David. With him were a thousand men from Benjamin, and Ziba, the servant of Saul's house, and his 15 sons and 20 servants rushed down to the Jordan before the king. Uh, they crossed the ford to bring over the king's household to do his pleasure. And Shimei, the son of Gera, fell down before the king as he was about to cross the Jordan. And he said to the king, let not my lord hold me guilty or remember how your servant did wrong on the day my lord, the king, left Jerusalem. Do not let the king take it to heart. For your servant knows that I have sinned. Therefore, I behold, I have come this day, the first of all the house of Joseph, to come down and meet my lord, the king. So how do, what's Shimei's uh, attitude? He's going to support David. More than that, what is he? What is he saying to David about himself? He's repenting. <laughs> yeah, big time no. repenting. Yeah, what I did was wrong. It was a sin. I'm asking you to have mercy on me and don't remember it. And uh, how does David deal with him? Well, he's got a general there. Well, one of his leaders, that's uh, um, Abishai. What does Abishai want to do? Verse 21. Off with his head. <laughs> yeah, Abishai, let's kill him. Uh -huh. You had a chance before, you didn't do it. Now here he is again. And David responds in verse 22. You shall not die. Yeah. Kind of puts uh, um, Abishai in his place. Basically says, don't you know that I'm the one that rules over Israel? <laughs> uh, we talked about you shall not die. That's echoing. Was David ever told that when he committed a grievous sin? Mm -hmm. So what Nathan told him <clears throat> when he was confronted with the sin of killing Uriah the Hittite and uh, adultery with Bathsheba. So what principle from scripture is David living by about forgiveness. forgiveness forgive others as we have been forgiven just as David received great mercy and grace he passes it along to Shimei because perhaps he knows the Lord loves Shimei as much as <laughs> he loves David next up is Ziba and Mephibosheth And that's uh, 2 Samuel 19 through 24. We also have down uh, chapter 16, 1 through 4. That was the uh, Ziba coming out, loaded with a bunch of stuff on the Mephibosheth's donkey, saying when David was headed out of town, here you go, David, my gift to you. Not really sure where Mephibosheth is. He must have stayed back in Jerusalem, and he's supporting your son Absalom. So David says, you know what? You're a good and faithful servant. I'll give you all of the inheritance that was Saul's, uh, and belong to Mephibosheth. I'll give it to you, Ziba. It's all yours. And now here David is returning, and uh, Ziba and Mephibosheth come and meet him. 
in the verse 24, and Mephibosheth, the son of Saul, came down to meet the king. He had neither taken care of his feet, nor trimmed his beard, nor washed his clothes from the day the king departed until the day he came back in safety. Which tells you what? What is Mephibosheth? What is his uh, appearance trying to communicate to David? No one was taking care of him. No one was taking care of him. Perhaps he's in sorrow. He's in mourning over the king, what has happened to the king. Uh, and when he came to Jerusalem to meet the king, the king said to him, why did you not go with me, Mephibosheth? And he answered, my lord, O king, my servant received me, for your servant said to him, I will saddle a donkey for myself that I may ride on it and go to see the king for your servant is lame. So he's saying about uh, Ziba, he didn't, he didn't get me ready. He didn't help me to come and see you. Instead, he took the donkey and he took stuff up to you. He has slandered your servant, my lord the king, but my lord the king is like an angel of God. Do therefore what seems good to you. So what is Mephibosheth's attitude as far as all of this that has happened? Is he strictly demanding justice against Ziba? No. No. Goes on to say, uh, <laughs> for all my father's house were but men doomed to death before my lord the king, but you set your servant among those who eat at your table. What further right have I then to cry to the king? So he recognizes his place. I don't have the right to ask for anything back. Basically just saying, I'm, I'm glad you're back. I'm glad you're okay. So David has heard Ziba's side of it, and now he's heard Mephibosheth's side of it. And how does he respond in verse 29? Divide the kingdom split it. King said, why speak any more of your affairs? That's it. That's enough. Both of you stop. Here's what we're going to do. You can each have half the land. Which we said, uh, you know, kind of sounds, Mephibosheth is probably the one that was wrong. But, uh, and it kind of sounds like maybe David should have gave everything back to him because Ziba was lying. Uh, but still, Mephibosheth is at the palace. He's eating from the king's table. Um, he's more, more than seven. See, we encounter a guy named Barzillia. Barzilla. And uh, read those verses 31 to 39. Now, Barzillai, a Gileadite, had come down from Rogalim, and he went on with the king to the Jordan and escorted him across the Jordan. Rogalim is over by the city where David had been holed hold up uh, just before and during the battle against uh, Absalom. He was a very aged man, 80 years old. He had provided the king with food while he stayed in the Hanaheim, for he was a very wealthy man. And the king said to Barzillai, come over with me, and I will provide for you with me in Jerusalem. Why, why is David wanting to do this? Provide for him? Because he provided for David and his men when they were up there. Yep, David didn't have anything there. He, he had fleed from the city. So now that he's back, back in the palace, he has more than enough to care for him. He wants to pay Brazilii back, right? As you help me, let me now take care of you. And, uh, but Brazilii said to the king, how many years have I still to live that I should go up with the king to Jerusalem? I am this day 80 years old. Can I discern what is pleasant and what is not? Can your servant taste what he eats or drinks? Can I still listen to the voice of singing men and singing women? Why then should your servant be an added burden to my lord, the king? Your servant will go a little way over the Jordan with the king. Why should the king repay me with such a great reward? Please let your servant return that I may die in my own city near the grave of my father and mother. But here is your servant, Chimhem. Let him go over with my lord, the king, and do for him whatever seems good to you. And the king answered, Chimham shall go with me, over with me. And I will do for him whatever seems good to you. And all that you desire of me, I will do for you. So how does David uh, deal with uh, Brazili? He let him get what Brazili wanted to stay, to stay at his home. Yep, because he says at his age, 
would I really enjoy all of the things that are to be enjoyed at the palace? I'm old, I would rather be here and, and die and be buried with my family. And do you remember who we thought Chinaham might be? Mm -hmm. Rosilii calls him your servant. Uh, Bible commentators think possibly this might be a relative or a son of Brazilii. So even though I can't go, David, allow my son, who has many, many more years than I am, allow him to go and enjoy this. If, you, if you're going to pay somebody back for this, let it be him, not me. Which is kind of an unselfish thing, isn't it? Especially if it's not any relation to him, but just somebody he knows. That would be a wonderful, gracious thing to uh, allow him to do that. Good. Comments or questions on any of that? Is David showing himself as a uh, good diplomat here? Yeah. Yeah. I think so. We know David in the past, if you get on his wrong side, he's not afraid to draw the sword and cut you to pieces, but he takes care of those who love him and take care of him. And those that have stood against him, he's willing to forgive, especially on the on the cusp of trying to bring the country back together. Question 13. Those loyals to David uh, usher him across the Jordan. Yet quarreling persists between Israel and Judah. Before the royal party can reach Jerusalem. Sheba leads the men of Israel in revolt in an attempt to unify his support in the kingdom. <clears throat> David has replaced Joab as commander of the army with Amasa, Absalom's former general. How does David propose to deal with Sheba? He sent Amasa over to get him. Sends, tells Amasa to do what? Call the men of Judah together. <clears throat> You're the new general. Call the army together. Get, bring them to me here within three days and be here yourself. King's orders. How does Amasa do with that? He doesn't do it. Right. He goes to summon Judah. <clears throat> some of the men, but he delayed beyond the time set. He couldn't bring him back to David within the three days. We're not sure if he was just lazy or um, I think more than likely they don't want to follow. And David sees that, so what does he, who does he promote next? Was it Abishai? Yep. Who could he have called? Joab. Yeah. <laughs> but he doesn't want to. He's already replaced Joab. He doesn't want to go back. He doesn't. So, uh, and Abishai seems to have done it. He gathers <laughs> them and uh, they go out and they meet at the rock, the great stone, Gibeon. And uh, why does David want to do this? Why is he so keen on getting the men together and going after uh, um Sheba so quickly. Because he was trying to do a revolt and he was trying to get the people who like him. I mean, he was trying to. David sees the, the longer he waits, what will Sheba do? Gather more people. He might gather more people. And here he's crossed the Jordan <laughs> and he was welcomed by some men from uh, his own tribe, Judah. And, and some of the Israelites. Yet here's this bickering. If we don't put a stop to it now, we're going to be having another great big civil war like we just got done with it. David doesn't want that. So let's squash it right now. Send the army out to get him before he can gather people around him and show. What would that show to the nation? You should follow David. David takes care of things, doesn't he? He's not going to sit by and allow this to continue. If you have... Uh, dreams about taking over and, and, and rebelling, know that he's going to stand up and take care of it. He's not a man to mess with. So um, 13b, 
How does Joab intrude on David's plans? Well, he killed Amasa. Yeah. Walks up and who is who is and how he deals with Amasa? Who is that like? Uh, somebody else that Joab uh, took care of much earlier, a rival. A rival who David was going to appoint, possibly appoint to be over the army. Abner, Abner yeah. Joab came up to him in the city. Abner was on his way back. Uh, David had given, had declared nobody should touch him, let him go home in peace because he was going to rally uh, Israel around David so he could be the uncontested ruler of the nation. <clears throat> Joab catches up to him and in the city gate, which was where you met and you talked, he comes up, uh, Joab comes up, same thing, very, very friendly, sticks the knife in and kills him. And we have him doing the same thing here. He's a sly old bugger, isn't he? Question 14, read 2 Samuel 20, 14 to 26. In your opinion, who was really responsible for putting down Sheba's revolt? The wise woman. <laughs> you think so? Why, why would you say the wise woman? Because the people that of that um, town that she was in, they all got together and did Sheba in mm -hmm. and kept Joab out and protected the city. Mm -hmm. Did Joab have any part in it though? Probably giving them incentive to, <clears throat> to kill Sheba. He, he led the troops, he got him there, uh, started to started the process of invading, knocking down the walls and invading the city. Had he not done that, do you think maybe the people of that town would have been so keen as to give up Sheba? No. No. Part of it is him, isn't it? He goes and he asks, he, he follows what David said. And then she's a woman. And, and I'm sorry to say back then in that society, uh, men really didn't look for advice to women very often. So she calls down and asks if he's Joab and wants to talk to him. What could he have, how could he have responded? Could have responded, I don't talk to any women. Yeah. <laughs> but he doesn't. He engages in conversation with her. And, and through that, um, she is able to talk to the townspeople to find out exactly what he wants, talk to the townspeople, and she gets them to hand Sheba over. So she does have, possibly you could argue, she has the greater responsibility, but definitely if, if Joab hadn't done what he'd done, they probably wouldn't have handed him over. Questions or comments? Question 15 says, or yeah, 15. More often than we would probably like to think, family disunity and envy have erupted in battles and have engulfed whole nations in civil war. Our family squabbles aren't likely to be written up in history books as David were. Nonetheless, discord in our families can damage our witness and sap our strength for service. You don't have to uh, give voice to it, but have you ever been part of a... <clears throat> family squabble, either your uh, immediate family or near close relatives. Makes holidays kind of hard, doesn't it? Especially if you're in the middle of it <laughs> and both sides are talking to you and telling you how bad the other side is. 15A, 
In Galatians 5, 1 through 12, Paul urges his readers to avoid legalism, the teaching that we make ourselves somehow acceptable to God by good behavior. And we can read through that. Galatians 5, 1 to 12. You can turn there. I'm going to read a bit of a different translation than what you have, and you follow along with me as best you can. I'll put that on the screen. Galatians 5. Starting off in verse 1. In freedom, Christ set us free. Therefore, continue to stand firm and do not again entangle yourselves in the heavy yoke of slavery. Behold, I, Paul, I myself am saying to you that if you should be allowing yourselves to be circumcised, then Christ will profit you nothing. Indeed, I am again testifying to every man that is that being circumcised means he is indebted to do all of the law. You all have been suffered from Christ, whomever among you are making yourselves righteous or in right standing through the law. You have fallen away from grace. So stopping right there, what is this yoke of slavery that Paul is talking about? That Christ set us free from? The law? Yeah. Following the law, to be right with God, to be in his favor, to stand and be justified, to be just as if I'd never sinned. And he points in particular, what part of the law are they struggling with? Verse 2. Circumcision. Circumcision. So who's telling them they need to be circumcised? Jews. Yep. The Jewish believers. Yes, you believe in Christ and that's all well and good, but you know what? To really stand before God and be right, you got to be circumcised. That's the way it was before and that's the way it is now. And Paul's comment is, if you allow yourself to be circumcised, what does that then mean you must do to be right with God? Keep the whole law. And that's because if you turn to the law or you say, well, it's Christ, but it's also circumcision, do you still have the gospel? Paul says, no. If you're going to look to the law to be right with God, you've lost Christ. Because it is by grace alone through faith alone. Adding any part of the law to salvation, you have fallen away from grace. Are we sometimes eager to look to our works and the things that we do and say for the reason why we're right with God? We do. It, it's a hard thing because because that's how we are right and, and have friendship and relationships with each other, isn't it? I do nice things for you, I and, and you do nice things for me. And by doing nice things for you, I engender feelings of friendship and fellowship with you but that does not work with God. And why doesn't it work with God? We aren't good enough. We can't. We, we, can, we can try as we might. We can never do the works that are sufficient to make us right with God. We can never, ever earn favor with God through what we do. And what does that say to grace? What are we saying about Christ's sacrifice if we think that we have to do even the slightest amount of works to be right with God? We're saying it doesn't count that he died for us. It wasn't enough. You think about just how horribly Christ suffered for our sins and did that out of love. And that's a matter of not being thankful, isn't it? Not enough, Jesus. We continue on with verse 5. For we who are in the Spirit through faith wait eagerly for the hope or the expectation of righteousness or right standing with God. So don't we have that now, though? Through faith. Aren't we declared to be justified or declared to be right with God through all Christ has done? 
So what do you think is this hope that he's talking about? Keep in mind, that's a declared righteousness. In other words, I'm not in right standing because of anything that I do. If you want to look at my works, I, that shows the exact opposite thing. Yet, because of Christ, God declares me to be in right standing with him. Because of Christ. Will there ever be a time when I will stand and be perfect before him? Through Christ. On the last day. Yeah. On the last day, I not only receive a new body, but my soul has been changed. That sinful heart that I have in me is gone. I no longer desire to do anything that's against the will of God. And at that point, that point, I will, in and of myself, be perfect, be justified before him, be in right standing with God. Paul continues on. For in Jesus Christ, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision is having any power but only faith through the sacrificial love that continues to work for our advantage. Works don't count. Only the love of Christ that comes through his, his gift of grace. Verse 7, Paul says, You were running well or making progress. Who cut you off? Who hindered you? So that you no longer persuaded in the truth. This conviction you have is not by means of the one who continues to call you. So who's telling them this? First of all, he gets on their case. You were running well, you were making progress. What does that mean? For a Christian? Faith. You're growing in faith. You're living out your faith. We call that the work of sanctification. We're being changed to become more like Christ, to understand how bad is our sin, and how great is his salvation, and that third use of the law where we desire to follow and obey him out of love because we realize what a great sacrifice. Paul says, you were doing that. You were doing great. And now you've stopped because you're no longer looking to grace through faith. Now you're looking back to yourselves. This message, this conviction you have is not from the one who originally called you to faith, not from the Holy Spirit that called you through the gospel. It's from somebody else. And he makes this comment, a little leaven is leavening the whole mass of dough. And what do you think that means in relation to what we're talking about here? What is the little leaven? Couldn't faith, but that's not what Paul, Paul's not uh, upset that they have faith that's growing. What they have is not faith, it's sin, sinful works, this reliance on works. And you just need a little bit of that in there, and all of a sudden it spreads and it ruins the whole thing. And that's why even the slightest little bit of works attached to your salvation makes it no longer valid, it ruins it all. It's got to be by grace through faith. In Verse 10, Paul says, I have confidence in the Lord that you will have no different opinion or understanding than mine on this subject. In other words, you're going to come with, you understand this now. You're going to continue to follow me. This is what I taught you before. Don't listen to them. Come back and listen to what I'm saying. And that the ones causing you this trouble, basically insisting on circumcision, will bear judgment from the Lord. He will take care of them. You ignore them. Uh, verse 11, indeed, brothers, if I myself am still proclaiming circumcision, then why am I still being persecuted? If that were the, the case, um, if I was preaching circumcision, then the cross, uh, then the cross, the cause of the, of the cross would no longer be considered an offense that I am being persecuted for. In other words, if I'm preaching circumcision, why are they after me? They're after me because I'm not preaching, preaching circumcision. I'm preaching the cross, and the cross is, is an offense. We don't want to hear that Jesus did it all, that he had to suffer so much for us. We want our works to mean something. And then finally in verse 12, this is a great line. And I wish that those who were turning you upside down on your thinking about salvation would castrate themselves. In other words, you want to talk about circumcision? <laughs> Cut it all off. <laughs> Paul is not too happy with them, is he? 
So that's Galatians 5, 1 through 12, Paul urging his readers to avoid legalism, this whole idea that our works mean something before God. And then in Galatians 5, 13 to 26, Paul directs our conduct away from license, misusing our liberty in Christ as an excuse to act lovelessly and selfishly. So read Galatians 5 and then describe the family or a congregation that does verse 25, walks by the Spirit. So we read the first part. Um, once again, in your Bibles there, um, we'll read through, uh, I've got a, a different translation here that I'll read. Uh, we'll read 13 through 26. Verse 13, for all of you, brothers, were called on the basis of freedom. Do not let the freedom, your freedom, be a launching pad for the flesh, but rather through sacrificial love, you must be slaves to one another. So what is Paul saying about our freedom? Our freedom we have in Christ is we don't have to obey the law to be right with God, right? But don't let that be, how would it be a launching pad for the flesh? How, do, how can people use that uh, concept that we don't need to follow the law to be right with God? What is that? How do they then look at the law? They can do whatever they want. Yeah, it's, it's all okay. forgiven. Okay. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter anymore that God created a man and woman. You can change your sex, no problem. Doesn't matter that marriage is between one man and a woman, no problem anymore. We're free from those regulations. We're not. How are we supposed to live? In verse 13. Serve one another and through love. Yeah, and that love is the love of Christ, the sacrificial love, the love that says, I give up my rights and my responsibilities to serve you. And actually, it's not just serve, that serve word is actually the word for slave, to be slaves to one another. Slaves is, is works because we, I don't do it. I shouldn't do it to earn your favor. I should do it just because Christ loves you and he loves me so much. That should be my impetus for doing that. Verse 14, for the entire law has been fulfilled in one statement. In this, you shall sacrificially love your neighbor as yourself. Verse 15, indeed, if you are lacerating with your teeth and devouring one another, then take heed lest you may be consumed by one another. What do you think he's talking about there? Lacerating each other with their teeth, biting and devouring one another. How do we bite and devour one another? Is it just gossip or? Mm -hmm. Gossip, rivalries. Inability to forgive one another, so always biting and attacking, always have a nasty word for one another. What translation are you reading from? I mean, that makes some things a lot more clear than with this. It's translation from the Greek. <laughs> it's, oh. it's, it's my translation. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, good. I'm glad. I was hoping it didn't help confuse you more because this, this can be kind of hard. Mm -hmm. uh, verse 16. Indeed, I am saying you must be walking or conducting your life with the Spirit, and never, ever should you fulfill the desires or the lusts of the flesh. For the flesh is what the flesh desires is against the Spirit, and the Spirit, what the Spirit desires is against the flesh. For these stand opposed to one another, that you may uh, also desire those things that you should not, that you will not be doing them. You should not desire those things you should not be doing. So we have the flesh. And, and what is Paul talking about? What is the flesh? It's our sinful heart. It's a desire that we were born with. And how does that compare with what God desires, the Holy Spirit desires for our lives and wants us to do? At odds with each other. <laughs> Polar opposite. Yeah. Any, anything that I desire to do in my heart apart from scripture, know that it is wrong because it's always centered on me. Even if it might be, well, I'm going to go help Norma. I don't watch that because am I going to help Norma to be a good Christian, to show her Christian love, to be a slave to her? Or am I going because maybe she'll feed me? 
And it doesn't seem like a big thing, but that's that's not how we're supposed to live. We're supposed to do things for each other, not desiring to be paid back for anything. And the thing is that um, the devil, when you start thinking that I'm doing it the right way, he just puts those other thoughts in your mind that, you know, that are you really doing it for <laughs> this other reason? You know, it's just a battle. Look how good I am. Yeah. Look what a good guy I am. Everybody look at what a good guy I am. Yeah, there's always that temptation. Isn't there? Verse 18. Indeed, if you are being led by the spirit, then you are not under the law. That's interesting, isn't it? And that's because he said the law is not about strictly keeping the commands like the Pharisees would do. The law is about love. And the spirit engenders in us the fruits of the spirit, which are all heart feelings directed towards unselfish love toward others. If we are being led and living by the spirit, then we, we are fulfilling the law, right? We said that earlier. Uh, verse 19, indeed, it is evident the works of the flesh, which are fornication, uncleanliness, licentiousness, idolatry, practicing spells and sorcery, enmity or hostility, uh, contention, jealousy, fits of rage, rivalry, dissensions, uh, discord. Envying others drunkenness and partying, things like these. I am warning you beforehand about these things. Even as I warned you before that continuing to do such things, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. I think that we, all of those things we would agree are all sins. And some of those, keeping in mind that we, uh, it's not just what we do, but it's what we think, can be convicted of some of these things. Um, Paul's not saying, hey, you fall once and you're done. You're out of the kingdom. It's an important thing. It's not, it's continuing to do them. It's allowing them to be your lifestyle. This is how I live. And once again, why can I live that way? Because Christ has forgiven everything. I can do whatever I want. This is that life that we live when we're living by the sinful flesh. Living do whatever I want. So Paul has a, he, verse 22, he says, no, this is how we should live indeed. What's the fruit of the spirit? Sacrificial love, joy, peace, uh, forbearance, or long-suffering, kindness that meets the needs of others, inherent goodness, faithfulness, gentle strength, self-control. Against these things, there is no law. So there's another take on the fruits of the Spirit. Uh, 20, verse 24, indeed, those of that are in Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its afflictions and his inordinate desires. Verse 25, if we are living in the spirit, then in the spirit, we should also be living or walking. Verse 26, why should you not become boastful? We should not be provoking one another, continuing to envy one another. So verse 25 is what we're supposed to look at. Families or congregations that are living in the spirit and walking in the spirit. What would that look like? Would it look like David's family at all? No. <laughs> Definitely not ours either. How would it look? Not by the spirit. If we do, Faith. how are we treating others? Out of love. Yep. And, that, and that kind of love means we, who's most, who's more important in our life? The other person. The other person and not us. But keeping in mind that the one that's most important is the Lord. Mm -hmm. And so if, if to have peace with them, if they want us to change the way we act, to stifle our witness or to stop going to church or stop talking about Jesus or reading scripture, we aren't going to do that. 
but also in love. We're not going to hit them over the head with the Bible every time we walk in and see them, are we? Especially when they're having quarrels and squabbles with each other. How can we best show Christian love then? Offer forgiveness. Ah, forgive them, maybe a listening ear. Encourage them to talk to us. Not being too quick to come in and once again beat them over the head with scripture, but just listening. And then uh, doing a lot of prayer with the Holy Spirit as we listen and uh, responding how, what, what great forgiveness we have in Jesus Christ and how he forgives everyone. And he moves us to forgive and love. And I think you can see with people that volunteer of their time and talents unselfishly here in the church. We see that, don't we? Mm -hmm. We're talking to, well, I pretty much think everybody that's here in this Bible study, uh, I could describe that way. You all are very, very good with that. You unselfishly give your time and your talents. I see you here doing things all the time. Reverend Art can't be here all the time, but he's praying. He's, um, he's a witness to people when he goes riding on the bus with them. Um, yeah, you're, uh, you're living by the Spirit. Can we do better? Of course we can. Always. Do Does Jesus hate us because we don't do better? No. No. He loves us and continues to forgive us even during our failures, which is why we can rise up again and try to do better because he doesn't hate us. He loves us. Uh, 13B. How would remembering your baptism help you live the kind of lifestyle that you just described? What happened to you at baptism? I changed. Yeah. The Lord changed me greatly. Give me great patience and service and give me the gifts of the spirit immediately. immediately. What, did, what, what did he do to that sinful, selfish heart you like to listen to? I know I changed because people mentioned it to me. That sinful heart drowned. Yep. Daily, right? Daily. And it has to be drowned daily because we like to reach down and resurrect it up. Mm -hmm. But it's no longer the only voice speaking in our head, is it? The Holy Spirit is there, and he points out ways that we listen to that sinful, selfish heart too much. Also, there's a matter of identity. In baptism, whose did you become? The child of God. And, yeah, the Heavenly Father's child. Which means, what about me? Am I all on my own? No. Hmm. Should life in any way be all about me? No. I live to please him because I'm his child. Not to become his child, but because I already am. That's who I am. And a child acts like his father. Good to remember who we are. We're different from the world because we're not of the world anymore. We're members of his kingdom, members of his family. And as such, we should look at things differently and deal with others differently. And when we don't, we can always go to our Heavenly Father and ask his forgiveness and know that we have it. Any final comments, questions on what we've studied? Was it good going back over those chapters with the questions? Oh, yeah. We can uh, see if we can continue on. We're supposed to read uh, 2 Samuel 21. I'm not quite sure how far we'll get, but we can at least delve into it a little bit. So why don't we turn there? We got about uh, 10 minutes. Second Samuel 21.
Let's read uh, one through six. Now there was a famine in the days of David for three years, year after year. And David sought the face of the Lord. And the Lord said, there is blood guilt on Saul and on his house because he put the Gibeonites to death. So the king called the Gibeonites and spoke to them. Now the Gibeonites were not of the people of Israel, but of the remnant of the Am Amorites. Although the people of Israel had sworn to spare them, Saul had sought to strike them down in his zeal for the people of Israel and Judah. And David said to the Gibeonites, what shall I do for you? And how shall I make atonement that you may bless the heritage of the Lord? The Gibeonites said to him, it is not a matter of silver or gold between us and Saul or his house. Neither is it for us to put any man to death in Israel. And he said, wait a minute. I scrolled it up on you, I'm sorry. <laughs> what do you say that I shall do for you? And they said to the king, the man who consumed us and planned to destroy us so that we should have no place in all the territory of Israel. Let seven of his sons be given to us so that we may hang them before the Lord at Gibeah of Saul, the chosen of the Lord. And the king said, I will give them. So it's good to remember uh, who these Gibeonites are and why this is such an important thing. And to do that, uh, let's turn back to the Joshua. Book of Joshua, chapter 9. So this being Joshua, this is uh, Joshua leading the people of Israel to conquer uh, the promised land. Moses is dead and buried, and now they're taking over this land that God has promised them. And uh, they're having a lot of success everywhere they go, except when they disobey God one time about not taking uh, spoils from the city. God punished them, but then uh, that was the city of uh, Asa. Uh, they repented, and God allowed them to take Asa, and they've just been having success everywhere they go. Nobody can stand against them. So uh, Joshua 9, verse 3, I'll read. But when the inhabitants of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done to Jericho and Ai, they on their part acted with cunning and went and made ready provisions and took worn out sacks for their donkeys and wine skins, worn out and torn and mended, with worn out patched sandals on their feet, and worn out clothes, and all their provisions were dry and crumbling. So they're trying to present themselves as somebody who's traveled a long way. <laughs> all their stuff is worn out. And they went to Joshua at the camp of Gilgal and said to him uh, and to the men of Israel, we have come from a distant country, so now make a covenant with us. Why would they want to be from a distant country? To be safe. Right, because they know Joshua has been commanded to conquer everyone that's in the promised land. So they're saying, oh, we're not from here. We're from far, far away. We're not part of that area that God is giving them. Uh, but the men of Israel said to uh, the Hivites, perhaps you lived among us, then how are we to make a covenant with you? And they said to Joshua, we are your servants. And Joshua said to them, who are you and where do you come from? They said, from a very distant country, your servants have come because of the name of the Lord your God. For we have heard a report of him and all that he did in Egypt. And all that he did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Shihon, the king of Hezbon, and to Og, the king of Bashan, who lived in Ashtaroth. So the elders and all the inhabitants of our country said to us, take provisions in your hand for the journey, go and meet them and say to them, we are your servants. Come now and make a covenant with us. Here is our bread. It was warm when we left and took it from our houses as our food for the journey on the day we set out. To but now behold, it is dry and crumbling. And these wineskins were new when we filled them and behold, they have burst. And the garments and sandals of ours are all worn out from a long journey. So the men took some of their provisions, but that, what did they not do? Did not ask counsel from the Lord. They bought this ruse, hook, line, and sinker. And Joshua made peace with them and made a covenant with them to let them live, and the leaders of the congregation swore to them. And at the end of three days, after they had made a covenant with them, 
They heard that they were their neighbors and that they lived among them. And the people of Israel set out and to reach their cities on the third day. Now the cities were Gibeon, Sherephath, Baroth, and kirith Jerem. But the people of Israel did not attack them because the leaders of the congregation had sworn to them by the Lord, the God of Israel, that all the congregation murmured against the leaders. But all the leaders said to the congregation, we have sworn to them by the Lord, the God of Israel, and now we may not touch them. This we will do for them. Let them live, lest we, wrath be upon us because of the oath we swore to them. And the leaders said to them, let them live. So they became cutters of wood and drawers of water for all the congregation, just as the leaders had said. So the big, most important part here is that uh, Joshua had made a covenant before them, an oath to the Lord that they would not be touched. And even though Joshua is long dead, uh, does that covenant, does that oath, does that promise still stand before God as being important? Yeah, it does. Because does God change? No. God does not change. So what is it they want? The Gibeonites. <laughs> and why does David care? What's come upon the land? Famine. A famine. And when the famine happened, what intelligent thing did David do? Right. He went, yeah, he went and asked the Lord why. And he was told because Saul killed these men, tried to conquer and kill them when they were supposed to be protected by the oath made by Joshua. So David goes to the Gibeonites. What can I do for you to make atonement? And what do they want? The sons. Yeah, seven sons. I mean, this is serious. I mean, there's been, it's three years of no rain at all. What would have happened to the crops? There wouldn't be any. Livestock? Probably not many left. Fruit trees? Nope. Condition of the people? Starving. Yeah. It's serious stuff. So they want seven men. And what does David do? He allows it. Surprising, isn't it? I'm going to read on a little bit further here uh, through verse 9, 6 through 9. Where, uh, yeah. They're, they're asking for the, the sons of the one who destroyed them. So they're asking for those related to Saul. Because Saul's the one that persecuted them. Verse 7, but the king spared Mephibosheth, the son of Saul's son, Jonathan, because of the oath of the Lord that was between them, between David and Jonathan, the son of Saul. So once again, here we have an oath that steps in. Oaths are important, promises made before God. David is not going to give up Mephibosheth. The king took the two sons of Rishva, the daughter of Aya, whom she bore to Saul, Armoni and Mephibosheth. And the five sons of Merib, the daughter of Saul, whom she bore to Adrel, the son of Barzillai, the Mahalathite, and gave them into the hands of the Gibeonites. And they hanged them on a mountain before the Lord, and the seven of them perished together. They were put to death in the first days of the harvest at the beginning of the barley harvest. Now we see another name. We see a Mephibosheth back in here, don't we? We're told uh, that the king was going to spare Mephibosheth, but uh, that's in verse 7. But then we have a Mephibosheth mentioned in verse 8. Keep in mind that Mephibosheth in verse 7 is, says who? Who is, he, who is he identified as in verse 7? Jonathan's son. Right. And the Mephibosheth in verse 8 Is a son that was born by Rispha to Saul. So this is a different Mephibosheth. This is a son of Saul where the other Mephibosheth would be a grandson of Saul. 
So it's not David going beyond his word. There's another reason David might have allowed this to happen. And it goes back to Old Testament law. So let's turn back to Numbers chapter 35. Numbers chapter 35, and I'm going to read verses 30 to 31. If anyone kills a person, the murderer shall be put to death on the evidence of witnesses. But no person shall be put to death on the testimony of, of one witness. Moreover, you shall not you shall accept no ransom for the life of a murderer who is guilty of death, but he shall be put to death. So along with this being, you have to have more than one witness to a crime. If he's a murderer, he dies, right? These people of Gibeah, the Gibeonites, have said it was Saul and those connected with Saul who have persecuted us. And they're asking for these seven sons. And perhaps the commentators have said the reason why David gave it to them is because these are seven sons who took part in the slaughter of the Gibeonites. They were guilty of murder. Well, I thought all the sons of Saul had died earlier, except for Mephibosheth. Yeah, Mephibosheth was the grandson of Saul. That's true. That's yeah. Jonathan died. Jonathan's son. There must obviously be some either sons or relatives or something left of Saul. Uh, but that that's been the, uh, the the commentators have said these are men that uh, worked with Saul and were part of the slaughter. So they are guilty of murder. We don't know that. But we were reading that into the text. Mm -hmm. But we know David goes to the Lord and asks his advice. And while David is not wholly 100% true and he meets a sinful, broken man, um, it would seem kind of hard that he would turn and do this with innocent men over. Verse 31. Comments or questions? Kind of leaving things hanging there. We'll uh, we'll pick it up in chapter twenty one uh, when we gather next time. That'll be uh, November thirtieth. Is there any significance into the number seven in this in this uh, area? Could be. We know in prophecy seven is a number. Of, uh, yeah, it's complete working on the earth. But I, I'm not sure if we can actually read that in here. If we're talking about uh, Old Testament law and those that are guilty of murder being put to death, then uh, having seven just to be a symbolic number would kind of not be in line with keeping with that law, would it? Mm -hmm. Those are all good points, though. Anything else you noticed or wanted to comment on that you didn't have a chance to earlier? Well, I thank you all for joining us for Bible study. It was uh, not the usual talkative crowd, but I, I, I pray it was, it was good and it was, uh, it was very good. For the Holy Spirit. Let's, uh, let's close with prayer. Gracious God, Heavenly Father, you do send us many and varied blessings. We thank you for the peace and tranquility that we have in our families. It's not always that way. But you've given us your spirit. Help us in all situations, whether it would be families or friends, to be a word of grace and forgiveness, to be an example of your love, to be honest with people, to admit when we're wrong, and to ask forgiveness of others. Lord, help us to go forward this day and concentrate on how we can better show our thankfulness to you and others around us. Gather us for worship this evening. Be with all those who will provide for that worship service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thanks, everybody. God's blessings. We'll see you, you tonight. And see you on Sunday. Obviously, no Revelation Bible study. So we're done with that till the new year. Have a good day. Thank you. Thanks. You too. Bye. Bye. Bye.